verse 37, Acts 21, 37, through Acts 22, verse 21. Acts 21, 37 through 22, 21. Beginning in 21, 37. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, A great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to every one of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by, and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. This is God's word. Uh, Good morning to you, to all of you. Last week, we examined Acts 21 and 27 through 36, and as you may recall, we discovered certain characteristics of those who hate the kingdom gospel, and uh, <clears throat> we talked about uh, how they are lawless, truthless, not toothless, I said truthless, and ruthless, although some of them may have 
you know, inappropriate oral hygiene, but that would be lawless, truthless, and ruthless. Today we encounter another um, <clears throat> text involving Paul's conversion, and we're going to learn a, uh, some general uh, aspects of, of effective witness. You'll notice in the text you have the word testimony appears and appears frequently in the text that we have before us, the word testimony. Also, it, it, it comes from different directions. You have it coming from Paul to the crowd and he references other, others who have testimony. Um, so this is a key word and we'll hone in on it. We're going to use the text today as a springboard into witness, but before we do anything, we want to address a couple of issues. The tribune, that is this Roman leader, assumes that Paul, as you will note, as you heard read by Pastor Joel, the text says, as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? So Paul spoke to him in Greek, Koine Greek. And um, so immediately the tribune is thinking, hey, wait a minute, you must be that Egyptian chap, uh, that Jewish Egyptian who uh, led a revolt. Uh, it's, by the way, is recorded in Josephus' Antiquities uh, against Rome, and you took some 4,000 dagger men into the desert. And that, that is on his mind. Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt, led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness, the Sakarii, men of daggers? And Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus. So that's the historical reference here. And uh, if you want to read more on it, read Josephus Antiquities on this topic. Now, uh, some folks, critics, will say, oh, you know, the uh, Paul's conversion accounts in Acts 9, 22, and 26, ah, they just don't match up, uh, so the Bible's false. Well, what nonsense. The difference between Paul's conversion accounts in Acts 9, 22, and 26 are simply explained by the way people observe events and report on it. All taken together, you have the full picture. That's the simple answer, and if we'll talk later, I can show you more as to how the text fits together beautifully. So those are just some things to keep in mind as we go through the narrative today. And again, narrative is important. Narrative is very important. The telling of story under the power of the Holy Spirit, it speaks to, it spoke to the original church and it speaks to us today. Very important and powerful mechanism used by God to teach his church. So that's where we're going today. We're going to talk about effective witness. It's not exhaustive, of course, but we go to the Word to learn about witnessing. So let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, may we grow in our faith such that our witness might increase in effectiveness. This text, this narrative is, is a beautiful picture of this. Help me not to mess it up, Lord. Help me to speak well to your glory, that you would be exalted, that I would be minimal, that uh, the errors that I make would be uh, minimized by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would straighten out that which is crooked, and may your name be exalted in all things to the glory of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray these things. Amen. So we turn again to the text, Acts 21, 27 through 36, broken up into three sections. And <clears throat> having said that, once you look at the text, <clears throat> you see some important aspects regarding witness. Now, why would we focus on witness? It's very, very important. Charles Hayden Spurgeon, in his ministry, was a man of word and prayer, and he emphasized witness in his church. He served the Lord in London in the mid to late 1800s, and uh, he had an elder who was a particular evangelist, and he said, he earned for himself the title of my hunting dog. So one of his elders was a witness, and he was known as the hunting dog. Imagine being called that. It'd be, it'd be all right, I suppose. So he was the hunting dog, for he always was ready to pick up the wounded birds. 
Spurgeon wrote this, I remember when I have preached at different times in the country and sometimes here that my whole soul has agonized over men. Every nerve of my body has been strained and I could have wept my very being out of my eyes and carried my whole frame away in a flood of tears if I could but win souls. Isn't that wonderful? Imagine having that attitude across this country in every pulpit. If, 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 if this was on the heart, instead of politics, you know, oh, I wonder how I can make it in my denomination. I wonder, um, I wonder if I can play the games with culture and the people will like me. No, no, no. Spurgeon earned my whole, f- carried my whole frame away in a flood of tears if I could but, want, but win souls. Imagine the power that would come upon the church if our hearts, people like me, if our hearts were changed in such a way to desire the lost to be saved. Now, there are many evangelistic programs available for the church to consider, and and many of them are very good, I must admit. By far the best place to go, though, is to the Bible and to prayer, as Spurgeon did and many other uh, great evangelists in the history of the church. So we're going to examine one passage with the intention of answering this question. One question. What are the components of effective evangelism? And this is not exhaustive. Effective witness, effective evangelism, the sharing of one's faith to the glory of Christ. So now, what are the components of effective witness? What are the components of effective evangelism? What are they? Here are just three pull them out of the narrative, and then off we shall go into the world to serve the Lord. So the Bible says this, and it begins in verse 37, and it reads as such, as Paul, and I'm going to read all the way down to 22.5, As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, "Uh, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Paul listens and he says, "Uh, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, uh, a citizen of no obscure city. You see, Tarsus was a center, business arts in the ancient world. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when, he, when there was a great hush, and when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, first thing, what are the components of effective witness? The first one is this, is that we make connections. Make connections, particularly with our pre-faith experiences, but we make connections with those with whom we are speaking. So Paul begins by speaking in Hebrew. He's eloquent in Greek, and he's eloquent in Hebrew. I have the privilege to meet and and relearn Hebrew from Dr. Everson over at Emmanuel. And uh, I know he has a hard time with me. It's like meeting with this blockhead, you know, from Canada, and you're trying to get this Hebrew into him. And I'm trying to learn the vocab and the grammar and whatnot. And uh, he has a hard time, so pray for him. But the Hebrew language is beautiful. And when I hear Dr. Everson read it and pronounce it properly, uh, it's, it's a beautiful singing language. Imagine what was happening here on this day when Paul hushed the crowd, and he began to speak eloquently in Hebrew. Everyone wanted to listen. He was eloquent in Greek, eloquent in Hebrew. He knew God, and he wanted to share. Now he made a connection. He's speaking in Hebrew. One of the things that I want to do, I've said I want to do it, is not only relearn Hebrew, but I would like to learn a good portion of Somali I would like to speak to the Somali people in their own language. And why would I want to do that? I want to gather a crowd. 
when I go to minister, and some of us go to ministry, minister to the Somali community, I only know a few phrases. I would enjoy knowing more. Reverend Ali Mati explained that to me. It would be great if we knew more of their language and speak to them as such. So Paul is speaking in Hebrew. That's the first connection, the very first connection. Brothers and fathers, there's another one. He's being very polite. Hear the defense that I'm now going to make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in Hebrew language, they became even more quiet, and he said, I am a Jew. There's another connection. Born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel, a a respected teacher of the law. So he throws that name out, and they would know who he is, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers. He is being accused of breaking the law, and he's an expert in it. Isn't that kind of odd (laughs) to you? These people, uh, they are, uh, they're saying, you are breaking the law, Uh, but he knows it. He's an expert in it. Because there's something else going on. Something else is happening. In any case, the text goes on. Being zealous for God as all of you are this day. So he is recognizing their zeal or this religious passion. And now he's reflecting back to his days uh, before receiving Christ. I persecuted this way. He doesn't use the the term uh, church. He uses the way to the death Binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. There's a use of the word witness with regard to the council of elders. This would be another term for the Sanhedrin. I'm not saying we want to use that in the modern church. Tonight the elders will meet, or we could say tonight the Sanhedrin meets. I don't think we want to use that. This expression is reminding or should tell us that Paul is saying, look, you guys know me and you know me in another place. He's connecting with them. As the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness from them, I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. They can remember this. Just look, just remember me, people. And he goes on, as I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone about me. And that begins the next part. So here we have a natural break in the text. Down to the end of verse 5. What is he doing? He's connecting with them. Later on, he connects with them again. What does he do? He uses different words and phrases, such as God of our fathers. So he's connecting with the people. He does it because he must He was zealous. He persecuted the church. Philippians 3, 4 through 6. Read that later. You'll see Paul's own view of himself. Pharisee of the Pharisees, Paul. So he makes connections with the crowd in a truthful manner. He does so well. So we pray that we might do the same in this culture. We make connections, but we do it truthfully. We remind people from whence they have come. I am a Christian. I did not earn a thing from heaven. It's by mercy and grace. We tell our story and we make connections. It it is increasingly challenging to Christians, though, because of the nature of our culture. It's rapidly changing. We do not compromise the message. We don't lie about our heritage, but we ask the Holy Spirit for the words to say. The divisions within the the culture are many. I told you and warned you about critical race theory. I told you, I warned you, many have warned all, all of us, we have 
challenging. I read a little note from a Chinese scholar who is living over here now who said, in the great leap forward, Mao used critical race theory, or should I say critical class theory, to divide up China. Class theory. That was Karl Marx's idea too, by the way, if you've read Das Kapital. And, uh, or the, even the uh, manifesto of the Communist Party. In America, it's not class versus class, it's race versus race. And we in the gospel ministry enter in with the message of peace. We do not distort the gospel. We say, be careful. We are united in Christ Jesus, all nations, peoples, tribes, and languages around the throne of grace. That's why I'm so blessed by this church, because you have invited into your hearts people who live in northern Nigeria. And you've prayed for them, and you've given, and you still want to pray for them. You want to be a part with them, and I am glad to be with you in that effort. Our brothers and sisters in the north, we need them, and they need us to walk together to God's glory. So, we must think carefully as we enter into a culture of great evil, lying and deception. I've never, I mean, I've been around the bushes. John and I have been around the bushes. <laughs> but I've not seen this kind of wickedness. Now we must learn. God help us to speak to a culture that is out of control. Pray that we might do this, do it well, and honestly trust in the providence of God to give us the words to say, the power of the Holy Spirit. And young people may be saying, well, you know, I, I didn't, I have been raised in a Christian home. I have nothing that is astounding to say to anybody. I didn't steal 10 cars. Uh, you know, I, I didn't try to blow up this building or anything. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't try to... Um, destroy this or that. What can I say? Well, you can say an awful lot. You can say, I was lost as a goose in tall grass. And you can tell people that without hope, without a future. But Jesus saved me. Begin with that. So what are, the, what are the components of effective witness? Making connections, pre-faith experiences do help. If you're minimal, describe the, what lostness is, even for those who are we with a smile on one's face. The second uh, component of effective witness is to highlight God's sovereign grace. And we're going to enter into that now, having given this brief illustration. Verses 6 through 16 Think along with me. Think. Think. And I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, and a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. All right, we pause for a moment. This light from heaven is reminiscent of Exodus, the book of Exodus, chapter 3, chapter 13, involving Moses, Deuteronomy 5.24. This great light, let's turn there, Deuteronomy 5.24. My goodness, this is the word of God. And in this, in this text containing the, the, the Decalogue, we read... Deuteronomy 5, begin at verse 22. These words, the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mount out of the midst of the fire and the cloud and the thick darkness with a loud voice. And he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice, heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, behold, the Lord, our God, our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. 
This day we have seen God speak with man and man still live. This is the light that comes out of heaven in the book of Acts. And it is speaking about the presence of God, who, by the way, is um, the person of Jesus. So the deity of Christ is strongly emphasized here. Why are you persecuting me? By the way, to persecute the church is to persecute Jesus. This is a good reminder to the culture in which we live. It's a good reminder of, uh, from the church in northern Nigeria to those who persecute them. <laughs> if you persecute us, you are persecuting Jesus. Look out. I don't care about your great leaps forward. I don't care. I don't care what governments say when they try to crush uh, the church. No way. We will stand firmly in prayer with our brothers and sisters, and I know they are praying for us. God is with his people. This great light shone. To persecute the church is to persecute Jesus. Very important point to remember. Paul says in verse 8, I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting now. Those who are with me saw the light but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And he said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. The sovereignty of God. Jesus commands him to go into Damascus. You're going to receive your marching orders. Jesus is over the call and the conversion of Paul. Galatians 1.15, read that later, you will see it. He's a called out one, he's set apart by God. This is about God at work. It's not about Paul deciding to go on a journey. Oh, I think I'll go and wander around. The Lord said to him, rise, go into Damascus, there it will be told all that is appointed for you to do, God's sovereign grace. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand of those who were with me and came into Damascus. The sovereignty of God, speaking to Moses in the Old Testament and now to Paul. Make no mistake about it, when Paul is speaking to these people, he is alluding to that. So the audience will be thinking, or his crowd will be saying, hmm, there's something about this. Jesus speaking from heaven. There's this, this amazing light, and Jesus is speaking as Yahweh spoke in the Old Testament, directing Moses. Hmm, what's going on here? Now, the next, the next bit, 12 through 16, follow. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law... There again is a, a, another connection. Well spoken of by all Jews who live there, came to me and standing by me, said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. This is a miracle. Who does miracles? God, through the agents that he has on earth, and uh, particularly through his son. But you'll notice that the prophets in the Old Testament, God used them as well, Elijah, for instance. And uh, <clears throat> this should also be reminiscent of the messianic prophecies regarding the eyes of the blind being opened. So all of this is going on in the message. God's sovereign grace. He's over all things. He appoints. He directs. He, he heals. He saves. Brother Saul, receive your sight, that the very hour received my sight, and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one. Who's that? The Messiah. And to hear a voice from his mouth. The reference is to the Messiah, the righteous one. To hear a message from his mouth. This is the doctrine of God, sovereign, and desiring his people to serve him. You will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Wow. This is a sinner saved by the power of Jesus. Acts 4.12 comes to mind. Acts 4.12. 
What does the Bible say? In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else. Note the exclusive nature here. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other way. There's no other name. And so Paul says in his testimony, in his witness, he says, and he records these words, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. We remember reading about this in Acts 2.38, the language of of confession and repentance and receiving the Lord Jesus, tied up with with the wonderful picture of baptism, death, resurrection. All of this speaks of of uh, an account of a sinner saved by the power of Jesus. Acts 4.12 highlighting. So taken together, this section speaks of the sovereign grace of God over the entire situation. Review it. God came to him in the person of the righteous one who's the Messiah. God appoints. God heals. God saves. Man is not sovereign. God is. So, what do we do? What are the components of effective worship? The first one is make connections. Pre-faith experiences, yes. How about highlighting God's sovereign grace? Yes. May it be our goal in biblical, in biblical witnessing to get more acquainted with the doctrine of salvation is grace-based and not merit. I quoted last week from Dr. Machen's book on liberalism, and he said the main difference between... Uh, a, uh, a liberal and a Christian is that Christians believe in grace and the liberal believes in merit. Just as Paul noted between the Pharisee and the Christian in the ancient world, merit versus grace. Get to know a biblical understanding of salvation, grace-based and not merit-based. Very important, God's sovereign grace. So those are the two components so far. There's a last one. What are the components of effective witness? Making connections, highlighting God's sovereign grace and our need for him. Saying to people, um, well, I didn't earn my salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 and 1 and following, I went all the way down to 10. I didn't earn salvation. This is a work of grace. This is a work of mercy. This is something that... I did not earn. And so we turn our attention to those things when we witness. The last thing is to declare purpose. Effective witness consists of making connections, highlighting sovereign grace, and declaring purpose. Now let's go verses 17 through 21. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance. This is from the Holy Spirit. And I saw him saying to me, make haste. Who is this person called him? It is Jesus. Get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. So Jesus says, they're not going to accept your testimony about me, so leave. Then he goes on, and I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. So in effect, he would be a murderer, along with those who actually committed the crime. And then, here's the key verse, and it brings everything together in the narrative. What does Jesus say to Paul? And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Next week, we'll pick up the consequence when that one word is said, Gentiles. For now, he declares his purpose. He was commissioned to go to the Gentiles. That's his his main concern. Now, he still witnesses to Jews. We saw that. But his main concern is the Gentile. 
There is purpose in God's sovereignty for his people. Hayden Spurgeon had this burning passion in his soul to win the lost. And many others in the church as well, like George Mueller and John Patton uh, and many, many others. And I, I had the privilege, although briefly, uh, Edith Schaefer had a passion for souls, particularly for Jews. Francis Schaeffer's wife. And uh, I remember one evening when uh, Kate and I were in her host, or wherever we were in Rochester, and she, she had uh, Francis's Bible and she had it open to the book of Isaiah and she was sharing concerning the need to bring the gospel to the Jewish people, just as Paul had done. This was her passion. And so our passion is to reach everyone in the modern era, Jew, Gentile, to reach them all. Paul's had a particular punch to it from the Lord. And ours is in Acts chapter 1. Here is the great commission in the language of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 6, and when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, when you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While they were gazing into heaven, he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Here's the bottom line. This pulls it all together. Pray that we might, me too, this weak man, take the Great Commission seriously. Effective witness consists of making connections, particularly those pre-salvation connections, anything that would connect truthfully with the people around us. There are connections to be made with Paul. They um, had religious uh, aspects to them. We may continue to do that with some folks, but increasingly you're going to be meeting people who are basically cultural Marxists and don't even know it. (laughs) They're cultural Marxists, and you must tell them the truth of the gospel in a loving manner. Uh, So much has been spinning around, but I do believe that in our world as critical race theory, which is Marxist at its core, is being propagated, how can we witness to people who are caught up in this, in this, this evil? Well, we can begin by saying, I would do something like this. I would say, you know, when I was 17, I thought of myself as a cultural Marxist. And I learned a lot and read a lot But then when I became a Christian, I thought, my goodness, you know, isn't this stuff deceptive? How deceptive is this? And the deception that I I thought about in those days, I'm seeing, and I've seen it for the past 10, 15 years plus, in motion in this culture. So how does one connect? One would say, you know, do you really think that Karl Heinrich Marx cared about anybody but himself? Do you really, what is the legacy of Marxism in this world? How many millions have died and how many more will die because of that ideology? I have something to bring to you and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is our king. He can either be your loving savior or your just judge. What say you? We can connect with people, calling attention to the lies of the world, getting into the seams and pointing out the truth of the gospel. So we, 
We highlight sovereign grace. We say you can't earn this. You can't buy it. You can't do, you, there is nothing you can do to earn salvation. And I'm telling you right now, when someone may say, well, you can't, you can't do that. You, you can't tell me this. There ought to be laws passed saying that you can't share anything. Well, go ahead and do that, but I'm not going to stop because I have a purpose, and it's from God, and it is to share the gospel. It is to witness from my own personal uh, understanding of the gospel, which is growing, and from my own personal testimony, knowing the Savior. This is what I can say to you. Declare your purpose. I must do this. I will not be silenced. No government is going to pass a law that I'm going to obey regarding witness. If you want to stop witness, think again. Because the real church is going to keep on doing it. Period. We're going to keep on worshiping. Worship will fuel our witness, and we will keep going. We will not stop. Just pass the laws, and we will disregard them. Period. God be glorified. Effective witness takes into account the connections, the sovereign grace, and our declared purpose. We tell it like it is. Here's the challenge to all of us, like me. Are we ready to share the gospel by way of an effective witness? If possible, if you desire so, let's sit down together and begin to talk about your environment where you are and talk about how one might share the gospel of Jesus. It is far, this is what happens in the West. If the gospel is just something we take with us on Sunday and we wear it to look good in certain environments and it's no good at all the gospel must be upon our souls upon our hearts and burning such that we must share it if we're ready to share and to be effective let's sit down and talk about how you might want to present in the environment where you find yourself That's what it is. Now, if there's no desire to share the gospel at all, then maybe there's no Jesus at all. And I just want to read this. This is what Jesus said. <clears throat> In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's another way of saying repent and believe in the person and work of Christ who suffered, died, and rose again. We have the great privilege to bear the kingdom gospel in this sick world. If there is no desire to witness at all, then maybe there is no Jesus at all. Repent and trust in Christ. Are you ready to share the gospel? Help me, pray for me. I want to share the gospel more effectively. I want to learn. I'm relearning Greek and relearning Hebrew. Why? I want to get back to the original languages. I want to structure how I say things through that, those phrases and those wonderful truths because the time is short. I want to tell the truth in love to a culture that is disintegrating. God help us. Send the light, Lord Jesus. Here is the, the little quote to remember once again. When uh, Spurgeon writing, I'm going to ask you to pray this for me, this weak man that I am. I remember when I have preached at different times in the country and sometimes here with my whole soul as agonized over men. Every nerve of my body has been strained and I could have 
swept my very being out of my eyes and carried my whole frame away in a flood of tears if I could but win souls. Pray for me that that would be my passion as I head down toward the finish line. I don't want to run across the line. I want to fall across it to God's glory. That's my goal. So pray hard, please, and I'll pray for you. But let's come and talk together and take back the ground. That's it. Do we have a hymn? A song? Yeah, we do. And then we're going to have Reverend Phil is going to pray.